Paige Bergfeld disappeared on Thursday, June 28, 2007. When a person disappears without a trace, often the most critical information you have to work with is hidden in their actions and words from the days before they vanished. Paige Bergfeld's last known 24 hours may hold the clues to what happened to her. I said, if she's missing, you're involved in a crime. She never has left her kids. A devoted mother of three, beloved by friends and family alike, disappears without a word one hot summer day. And I said, well, where's Rob? That was my first concern after everything she had been saying to me. Friends are convinced that Paige's recent ex-husband must be involved. But detectives discover a secret part of Paige's life that holds more clues. What we had learned was that she had been putting herself out there as an adult court. Not even nightlife.com advertised everything from threesomes to partner swapping, erotic massage. Whatever line of work Paige is in, the job of the police is the same. Who is it out there that thinks that they can take away from my grandchildren and their mother? Who is this person? What kind of a human being is this? Friday, June 22nd, another gorgeous sunny day in western Colorado. Devoted moms Barbara Campbell and Paige Bergfeld are enjoying a pool party with their kids. We'd been playing for a while and then Paige showed up with her kids. Paige and I hung out for quite a while and we got to talk more privately. Barbara has often heard Paige's conflicting feelings about her recent ex-husband. She started talking to me about Rob and being very worried. On June 22nd, Barbara notices something out of the ordinary in Paige's manner. At the pool party, she was downright scared. It was, I am really afraid that something's going to happen now. Barbara is extremely concerned. You hate for your friend to say that. You just want to make them safe, and you can't do that. My parting words to her were, don't worry about Rob. To see you, he'd have to come over Red Mountain Pass, and maybe the mountain will just take care of him. So it wasn't real polite, but it's one of those things you say to comfort a friend. I said that, and she kind of laughed, but and then she drove off. I certainly didn't know that within a week she would be gone. Four days later, a local group of mothers has a get-together. On Tuesday, June 26th, about 20 members of the Grand Junction chapter of Moms Club meet for a night on the town. Moms stands for Moms Offering Moms Support. And it's an organization for stay-at-home moms, a lot of whom have home businesses and do lots of other things the way Paige did. Moms Club was always a natural fit for Paige, with her devotion to family and to her children above all else. Paige loved her children so much. She enjoyed being successful, but I know in her heart of hearts, she probably wished that she just didn't have to work at all and could be with them all the time. We were all in awe of her. She probably had a huge influence on a lot of other moms and how they parented because she handled things differently. There, there wasn't a whole lot of yelling. She wanted to make everything calm and peaceful and stable. <sighs> At Tuesday night's dinner party, Paige can't quite maintain her normally sunny demeanor. Her friends notice something is wrong. We met at the ale house uh, here in town. Paige showed up a little bit late, and she looked gorgeous as always. She had her, her normal glow about her. She was here, and you were going to notice her. <laughs> Not because she insisted that you did, but just because that's that was her presence. A couple of people said she looked beautiful, but she seemed sad. There was something in her eyes that was bothering her because that previous Friday where she was at my house and it unloaded all of this fear, and then to see that in her eyes, I was getting really worried for her. But Barbara does not have the time that night for a heart-to-heart. She still wonders to this day what was on Paige's mind. Paige Bergfeld works hard, so can spend time with her children. 
Not only does she care for three small kids by herself, but she is also the sole financial provider for her family. These responsibilities generate some creative thinking on her part. Paige found herself in a situation where she was the sole breadwinner to take care of her three kids and a large mortgage. I think she displayed some real ingenuity. She set up a series of dance schools. She got into Pampered Chef, and she also sold these slings for nursing mothers. So she'd do different things to make money. Reporter Nancy Lofholm has covered Grand Junction for the Denver Post. For the women who were home with their kids, it was something they could do because they could have the parties at home and, and not have to go out and work. Pampered Chef pays representative commission to promote their products through dinner parties. Paige Bergfeld really made money at it. It sounds like she was good at it. Two days later, Paige calls her friend Andrea, sounding much more upbeat than the other night. I was in a hurry, and I rushed the conversation, and of course, hindsight, I wish I hadn't. But she sounded very happy. She sounded like she was really looking forward to the day. Paige, in fact, has exciting plans. A positive force from her past has come back into her life. Her first love. I think Paige is fairly typical. You know, Paige, as a high school kid, was kind of skinny, gawky, braces, so forth. I think her first reel swept off her feet was Ron Bigler, who was her first husband. That was the big one. She actually got a four-year scholarship in nursing at the University of Florida in Gainesville. And then Ron Bigler moved down there, too. And I would assume that uh, distracted the academic uh, pursuit. So they ended up moving back to Denver and got married fairly promptly after that. Despite their love for each other, Ron is not yet ready to have children. Their differing feelings about parenthood eventually drive them apart. Paige knew that family was going to be huge for her. She already had that mothering instinct. Her kids were going to be the most important thing in her life. And so that's what kind of led that marriage astray. It was a very amicable divorce, and they wanted different things out of life, so they moved on. The high school sweethearts always remain friendly. And nine years later, after Paige is divorced from her second husband, Ron Beagler and Paige get back in touch. Paige started talking about Ron about three months before she disappeared. It was funny because I knew something was up with her. It just seemed like there was a little switch that turned on and she was just a little more sparkly, a little more happy. She talked to me about how she'd been seeing him and that she still really loved him and that this might be something that would work out. to meet Ron Bigler halfway between Denver and Grand Junction. She drove two hours east, he drove two hours west. For Paige, June 28th is starting out to be a very good day. They spent kind of a late afternoon doing that. She left and came back to Grand Junction. He went back east. When he arrived in Denver, about two hours, he called her. She wasn't quite to Grand Junction. Paige and Ron agreed to talk again later that night when Paige gets home. But Ron never hears from her. Friday morning, he called her and her phone immediately rolled over into her voicemail. This is odd. Because of Paige's children, she never turns her phone off and always keeps the battery charged. All day Friday, Ron continues to call Paige's cell phone called her several times during the day and it rolled over each time never touched base with her saturday morning he called again and it still did that this time he called the house and what ron learns scares him my eight-year-old granddaughter uh, answered and said that Paige had not come home thursday night ron took to his great credit called the mesa county sheriff's office and reported it First time I heard 
name Paige Brookfield was on June 30th, uh, the day that she was reported missing. This is one of these moments that's uh, freeze-framed in my mind. There are certain events that you just can see it. Everything stops and uh, you can see each detail. I'd gotten a cup of coffee at McDonald's and my cell phone rang and uh, the caller identified himself as a deputy sheriff with the uh, Mesa County Sheriff's Office. And he said, do I know that my daughter Paige has been missing? And I can just tell you that is a moment that, uh, <laughs> you know, you just never want to have. I said, no. I remember I paused and I said, if she's missing, you're involved in a crime. She would never have left her kids. He asked me, do you know that, that she was involved in an adult business? And I said, no. And frankly, that's the first I had ever heard of such a thing. It's the first indication that there may be danger beneath the surface of this model mother's life. My staff told me that there was a mother who was missing and that the circumstances of her love her children very much and uh, would not deliberately be gone from them. And I think we were en route within 20 minutes. Boy, when you, you get a call like that, you realize how nobody gets trained for that moment. When he reports her missing, Paige's first husband informs the police that she is working in adult entertainment. What we had learned was that she had been advertising and putting herself out there as an adult escort. As a family, we don't know anything about this adult business situation. I'm told by Ron that he knew that she was involved in an adult business and he was aware she was going to meet clients Thursday night and I assume we're talking about adult business clients. Paige maintains a profile on an adult escort website. NotEvenNightlife.com is a website where you can arrange what would appear to me to be sexual encounters. They advertised everything from threesomes to partner swapping, erotic massage. Paige tried to make her profile look a little more high class than some of the things on Naughty Nightlife. Some of them were pretty raunchy. Paige's picture was just a torso shot and um, she was dressed. She advertised herself as filet mignon as opposed to chopped meat. Investigators are aware that the nature of this business may have put Paige's life in jeopardy. That brings another level of complexity. But nevertheless, it was learned early on, and it begins to broaden the scope of what we're looking at. As with Paige's other jobs, she is well organized in her escort business. Paige advertised that she would be available for in-call or out-call, which I believe means that she would go to their homes, hotel rooms, or she would bring them to her office. Paige has been renting this office since March 2006, but no one in the building has any idea of what actually goes on in this room. The landlord thought that she ran an, an acupuncture office. That's what she had told him, and never had any reason to suspect anything different. One of the odd things that some of the other people in the building had noticed was that in her office she had a pin cushion with needles stuck in it. And that's not the way acupuncturists operate. I mean, a, a true acupuncturist has needles that are sterilized and they're in paper. That just um, was kind of a, almost a joke. Other people in Paige's office building saw men coming and going, sometimes as many as four, you know, men in, in one skimpy clothes and high heels. She didn't look like she was in the healthcare providing field, <laughs> but none of them really suspected what was actually going on. Paige lists her services as escort, erotic massage, private dancer, and available for groups and parties. But just how far Paige may have gone is unclear. From reading the critiques on Naughty Night, 
life for Paige. I got the sense that there was more happening than massage. They did mention that the extras cost them more, but they were well worth it. I think maybe Paige drew a line, no sexual intercourse. I mean, it wasn't prostitution per se. Whatever line of work Paige is in, the job of the police is the same. It's not our place to make a judgment about the activity. It's our place to investigate the facts and find out what happened. And ultimately, her friends believe that Paige is doing this work because it provides quick and easy money, all in an effort to support her children. Paige needed to make ends meet. She told me that a friend of hers had taught her how to give massages. And so we felt like, well, of course, Paige is just giving massages, perhaps not fully clothed or something. <laughs> but who's to say you can't do that? And we knew the escort side, perhaps dancing at parties. If it happens to be dancing with very little clothes on, Paige didn't have a problem with that. She was very comfortable with herself, with her body. And that's very different than actually having sex with someone. When first husband Ron Beegler calls the police on June 30th, Paige has been missing for 36 hours. Their first step is to account for where Paige has been during all of that lost time. Her business practices turn out to be a boon for investigators. We discovered that there were two cell phones, one for her and, and one for her business, and we were able to get information from both telephones. While Paige's family is in the dark about her adult business, for at least some close friends, Paige's life is an open book. She never hid anything. She was very open. And I don't think she had anything to hide. For her, it was strictly a business this isn't the first time that Paige got involved in adult entertainment. She was stripping in, in a Denver club, the Mile High Saloon, and her first husband knew about that. I heard from friends and family members that he was not thrilled about her stripping. In addition to questions about parenthood, in 1997, while Paige is still dancing at the Mile High Saloon. And it is there that she meets her second husband. But Paige's next marriage will come with its own complications. Rob Dixon met Paige while she was dancing at the Mile High Saloon in Denver. Uh, they hit it off and were married. Paige's friend explain that she is someone who goes out and gets what she wants. In 1997, she wants Rob Dixon and all the financial security he offers. When Paige met Rob, um, he came from a very wealthy family. So in part, she was attracted to that because she could be the stay-at-home mom. Rob Dixon's family had made a fortune during the 90s. Rob Dixon's father was one of the pioneers of the cell phone industry. Uh, and some money. In 1996, Rob sets up a foundation that gives millions of dollars to fire departments in Colorado. Rob Dixon is a trained paramedic. That's what he likes to do. He likes to help people in their time of need. Rob and his father began a foundation, the whole purpose of which was to supply needed equipment to fire departments, paramedics on the western slope of Colorado. Rob entrusts his money to an investor he meets in a strip club. And for a while, returns are good. The couple moves to Grand Junction in 1998 and starts having children the same year. Rob chooses to make no secret of his money. This is a town where if you want to fit in, you might get a pickup truck or an SUV. Rob at one time had expensive Porsches. He had Lexus, Jaguars, Range Rovers, and a lemon yellow Ferrari. I got the sense that Rob liked the tension in his nice home and his nine cars. People were very, very impressed. By this time in 2001, Paige and Rob have three children. It seems they have it all. Then, after September 11th, Rob Dixon's finances take a serious plunge, and all this financial turmoil takes its toll on the family. 
started noticing that I really never saw him. At Paige's house, you would expect Rob to be out mingling. These are basically Paige's closest friends. And he would go in the bedroom and close the door. Just avoidant. <laughs> it set up a really awkward tension. That was really upsetting to her that he'd make no point of being a part of any loss of Rob's fortune changes him for the worse. I think it was devastating. I think people that beg for look at me aren't I smart to be in the paper day in and day out having your bad decisions detailed to the community at large to someone who had been up there with an ego it's a long plunge down as the years pass Paige's family and friends grow more concerned about her relationship with Rob Paige made a 911 call in 2004. My husband and I were in a fight and he was supposed to watch my children while I went to work. He didn't seem to be okay, so I said that I was just going to take the children with me. But he wanted the children to stay with him and he said that I would come home and find them all murdered. By the time the police got there, it had all been resolved and there was no arrest. Rob's lawyer says that no arrest was made for good reason. Rob Dixon never threatened to kill children. Rob and his lawyer believe she made the call for ulterior reasons. The first time Paige called 911, she made an accusation that Rob Dixon was going to kill the children that had no basis in truth. The police came to the scene. There was nothing inappropriate going on. Nobody was charged. Rob was befuddled. He had no understanding as to what motivated Paige to make a false accusation about him. But fortunately for Mr. Dixon, it was soon very clear he had done nothing wrong and had no bad intentions. And it may have been the start of her campaign to get Rob Dixon out of the house. One year later, in 2005, Paige makes another 911 call. Paige called 911 and said that um, Rob Dixon had slapped her and shoved her while she was holding their youngest child. And at that time, he was arrested for domestic violence. According to the court files, Paige said that he had accused her of being um, a whore because she had clothing in her car that indicated to him that she was going out to do topless massage. Rob said that she had told him that she was having to do that again because they were running out of money. Rob's lawyer insists that Rob always dutifully supported his wife and family. Rob is arrested on third-degree assault, misdemeanor child abuse, and domestic violence charges. Rob pleaded guilty to harassment. It was a plea bargain, and he had to go to anger management classes. In exchange for this plea, the charges are eventually dropped. Paige Dixon claimed that Rob had struck her and the child. The problem was there were no signs of any injury. What actually happened, not really what you want the mother of your children and your wife to be doing. According to Rob, he never laid a hand on her. And he and I believe that that second call was manipulation by Paige. She was done with him. Rob's lawyer says this is an elaborate ruse by Paige to cast herself as the better parent so she can win custody of the children if they divorce. Two days after Paige's 911 call, Rob Dixon declares bankruptcy. His Colorado EMT Foundation is unable to pay for equipment it has donated, and taxpayers are forced to pick up the tab. Rob said that uh, eventually he lost over $10 million. I would think it was more than that. Not surprisingly, public opinion turns against him. I would have to say that Rob Dixon came to town as a hero. He was a godsend, and he was Santa Claus. And by the time he left, he was an awful scoundrel because a lot of the, the places that he had donated equipment to, it had been repossessed. He had just leased it and then didn't make the payments. And then after he got involved in a fire district here, he invested $3.2 million of their money in a shifty internet company in New York, and that money was lost. According to her loved ones, Paige and her children are feeling the effects of Rob's reversal of fortune. The relationship certainly started having cracks and coming apart. As the years went by, we see Rob as, as a sort of a Jekyll and Hyde personality. When they were first married, we knew virtually 100% good Rob. At the end of it all, it was virtually 100% bad Rob. I actually set up a bank account for Paige that was joint, and the purpose
purpose was that if she felt for any reason she needed to get away, she'd have enough money to do it. Paige's friends never doubt for a minute that her fear of ex-husband Rob Dixon is very real. One day we were at her house and there was no door on part of the cabinet. And so I asked Paige what that was all about. The oldest son was in trouble and Rob was angry with him. And so he was hiding in that cabinet from his dad. And Rob broke the door on that side of the cabinet when he was pulling the child out of there. Rob's lawyer explains that Rob did break this cabinet door. But by accident, the door simply came off its hinges, and no child was involved. It just gives me chills. Rob starts looking for work out of state, and friends raise the possibility of divorce with Paige. Rob was brokenhearted, but he's also a bright guy, and it seemed pretty obvious that his marriage with Paige was over. If she was going Paige finally accepts the idea that they should divorce. That's where I saw her sad a lot more because her dream was falling apart. She didn't have, you know, the traditional family and white picket fence. You know, it was all crumbling, and that was very hard for her. Rob Dixon leaves Colorado, eventually settling on the East Coast. But even after the divorce is final, Paige is documenting her fears about Rob on a website dedicated to pampered chef consultants. I've looked at the website, and it seems to also be a support group for these kinds of women. They get on and they tell about themselves. And I know that Paige did that. She talked a little bit about her divorce, her problems with her former husband. Paige said that she was afraid of him. One post even said that the kids were afraid that he would come and kill her. Were Paige's fears real? And was Rob Dixon somehow involved in her disappearance? Paige's friends say that she has told them of her fear of Rob. So when Paige goes missing, this is one of the first things friends mention to police. I definitely told the police I was concerned about Rob and that he might be a threat. In any investigation, one of the first things you're going to look at is existing relationships. In this case, Paige Burfield had two ex-husbands. In the case of Rob Dixon, they had a colorful relationship, and it was one that was not without strife. And there were 911 calls, and there was even a prior domestic violence arrest. And it piqued our interest with regards to trying to understand, did they have enough of a rocky relationship that created the motivation to try to, to harm Paige? Could Rob's temper have driven him to the ultimate revenge? It did not change the facts with regards to where we believe Rob Dixon was during the time of her disappearance and what he was doing at the time. According to Rob, he was at home in Pennsylvania when Paige's family called, completely unaware that Paige had disappeared. Rob Dixon was worried that something had happened to her, so he packed all his gear and headed for Colorado. Meanwhile, the sheriff's office is beginning their search for Paige. They start close to home. In any case like this, you want to do a cursory search of, you know, the house. One of the things that helped us to gain focus was the lack of things that we saw. We didn't see somebody who came home and packed. About 9.30 that night, a volunteer arrived with her bloodhounds. They went around the house inside, outside, and uh, then I was told they took them beyond to the desert. But nothing concrete is found. While searching for her car, investigators are also trying to track down Paige's last moves. Cell phone records and voicemail were a big clue in this investigation that gives us an idea of who she may have intended to meet with and who, you know, perhaps wanted to meet with her. We were able to identify individuals and contact them and try to learn their whereabouts and learn their relationship to her. Three days after her disappearance, there is a huge development. Paige's car is found in flames. Her vehicle then was reported to us on Sunday, found burning in an industrial area of Grand Junction, and it didn't take much to determine that it was probably that deliberately. It's a huge red flag. Now there's criminal behavior involved with it, and uh, it, it causes you to think about foul play. 
and that there's somebody that appears to be attempting to cover up a connection. If I didn't know before, I knew that point. We have a serious problem here. She is in a real bad spot. It was uh, probably the thing that made me really start freaking out and thinking that something truly awful had happened. Finding Paige's car tells police that she made it back to Grand Junction from Eagle on June 28th. I found out Paige was missing the Monday morning after she disappeared. My husband called and said, she's missing. And I said, well, where's Rob? That was my first concern after everything she had been saying to me. Mom's Club has a meeting scheduled for Monday afternoon, and it quickly becomes all about what's happened to Paige. The more they think about whether or not Paige would choose to leave her children, the more worried they get. We assume she's dead in one respect, but in another respect, that if there's any way for someone to be alive, Paige would find it. Because of another missing persons case in the Grand Junction area, a local search group had sprung up called the Abby and Jennifer Recovery Foundation. On July 14th, at 6 a.m., Paige's loved ones join this group in a massive effort to find any sign of Paige. This is a huge county. Uh, It's over 3,300 square miles. Uh, 74% of it's public land. It's from High Mountain Meadows all the way to Red Rock Canyon country that the Colorado River runs through. There's literally a million places to hide somebody and uh, a million places to go where you have privacy to do things that uh, bad people sometimes do. It's wide open. just can't believe how hot it was. When you're looking at 115 degrees, it is very uncomfortable. I just can't believe how much people will give of themselves when they see someone in a tight spot. There's a park downtown in which homeless people gather. And I took some of the flyers. I took a box of waters. There wasn't a lot of thank yous. And then I said, I need your help. another huge find. There were some items found in an area approximately 15 miles away from where the vehicle was found on a uh, state highway. It was exciting and hopeful at the same time that it was terrifying and sad. They found um, items from Paige's purse, from her billfold. They found a blockbuster rental card, her checkbook, cards, normal things people have in their wallet. The items were found on the opposite side of town from where her house is, the opposite side of town from where she would have come into town from Eagle. I think the police looked at the items that they found as possibly kind of a breadcrumb thing that possibly she might have thrown them out of a car. That had them looking then south of Grand Junction along the river. And they had divers, they had boats. The other theory was that possibly they'd been thrown out by someone as a way to divert them. However these items got there, the volunteers have to keep searching. You have to be prepared that you're trying to find a dead person is really what we were searching for ultimately. If she was alive, we weren't going to find her on our searches. If anything is found, it cannot be publicized for fear it could taint a future trial. You had to flag anything you thought might be related to her, and that could mean a lot of flags. Volunteers search throughout the summer. You don't develop uh, an extreme amount of confidence that you've eliminated all the areas. What you do is develop confidence that you're doing everything you can and moving on to other areas. But Paige is not found. Despite her friend's concerns, after interviewing Paige's ex-husband, Rob Dixon, and checking his alibis, police determined that he was not involved. And he is officially cleared. At this point, I've never uncovered anything that would suggest that Rob Dixon department focused on the men in Paige's life, as they should have. But they soon came to the conclusion that neither man could have been involved in Paige's disappearance. 
this only makes cops work harder to find a suspect. We even brought in uh, canines with specific experience in cold trails or cold tracks uh, to try to determine if we could link anything to the car. These cold case canines sniff out the area where Paige's car was found and lead investigators directly to the door of a local business. A man is about to be named a person of interest. Nearly a month after Paige Bergfeld goes missing, investigators name a person of interest. While much of the evidence must be kept secret in case of a trial, the public learns that canines led straight to this man's place of business. The canines were uh, useful in tying the car to the business. As a result of that, we're left with Lester Ralph Jones as a person of interest in this investigation to us. There is talk in the town that Lester Jones and Paige know each other and that he may be a client whom she refused to meet. I knew that she knew him. She had talked about her mechanic, Lester. I got the impression that he was very fixated on her. As best as I can tell, Paige and Jones knew one another and Paige found Jones repulsive and tried to avoid him. My husband ended up talking to someone who had a friend who had hired Paige. You know, he said she gives great massages. And he had actually approached her about a full service massage. And she refused. She said, no, you know, I give massages and that's that. He was like, I'll pay you really well. And she absolutely wouldn't go. Barbara wonders if perhaps, unlike this friend of a friend, Lester Jones couldn't take no for an answer. He is a big 66280. He served time in prison for an act of violence with respect to his ex-wife. According to Delta County Sheriff's records, in 1999, Jones chased his estranged wife up a mountain road in his car fast enough to set off her airbags. Her friend jumped out of the car and started running away, and Jones fired a gun at him. The bullets went through his hat. Mr. Jones was an RV mechanic here in Grand Junction after he had served three years of a five-year prison sentence for domestic violence-related crimes. Although Jones was imprisoned for assault with a deadly weapon, attempted second-degree kidnapping, and the use of a deadly... I see him having a low motive, and I see others that have a high degree of motive. I know investigators searched Mr. Jones' house uh, at least twice. They were particularly interested in a, a truck liner. They said they took several bags of things out of the house. And they did a lot of searching, but the investigators would never say what they found there or didn't find. And they would also never confirm that they searched his place of business. But I, I would assume that they did because the dog you know, it really doesn't make any sense that someone would go to all the trouble of trying to hide a murder and then put the victim's car in the parking lot next to where they work. Well, I've never been able to let go of the idea that Rob Dixon was somehow involved in this. He was the only person she mentioned being afraid of. In the face of intense allegations from Paige's close friends, Rob's lawyer maintains these claims are ludicrous. Rob Dixon talked with the investigators without a lawyer being present. He said he had nothing to hide. He passed a polygraph with flying colors. So it was pretty clear he could not have been involved in her disappearance at all. The biggest thing is we, we, we need to find Paige. We want to find Paige. Apparently, Jones and Rob had a connection through their jobs. The two of them worked for the same fire district, so potentially they stayed in touch. Rob would know that Ralph has a violent background. What better person to set up to knock off your ex-wife? Neither Rob or I had ever heard of Lester Jones. Jones and Dixon have never met. Jones and Dixon have never spoken. The claim that Lester Jones was being manipulated by Rob Dixon is hogwash, and why anyone would believe that story is beyond us. In spite of Paige's friend's suspicions and an alleged connection to Lester Jones, the sheriff's office still says Rob Dixon is not a suspect in this case. 
Neither Lester Jones nor his lawyer have ever made a public statement, and Jones has never been arrested or charged in connection with this case. The open-ended nature of this case leaves friends and family desperate for answers. Our investigation has not uncovered anything that uh, Paige is still alive. Paige has met with foul play, and we believe that it was likely surrounding her adult entertainment business, and we remain open to other possibilities as well, and won't rule anything out, but that is the focus that we have based on the facts as we know it uh, causes this case to get its day in court. Uh, certainly as bad as it is and how you fall into the depths of uh, depression and despair, there's also an element of anger. Who is it out there that thinks for whatever purpose they have for themselves that they can take away from my grandchildren and their mother? To take away this person's goals, their aspirations, to take away this great smile. Who is this person? What kind of a human being is this? One of the investigators told me, these kind of cases take six, sometimes even 20 years to solve. I responded to this guy, you may punch out at night to go eat dinner, but this never leaves me. And it never will.